Good morning and welcome to IGPP's Public Procurement 2022 towards continuous commercial improvement across the public sector. We're delighted to have you with us today and we will be joined by some excellent speakers offering their insights into the government's transforming public program, addressing and opportunities for progress. This topic is particularly relevant given that the procurement bill was introduced Lords last week and is due at second reading on the 25th of May. The keynote addresses today will consider the new amendments and ambitions going forward, and we'd be joined by a range of speakers from across health, academia, business, local, and national government. I'm Rosella, and I'll be your chair today on behalf of the Institute of Government and Public Policy, and I'll guide you through our sessions today. My pronouns are she, her, and as a short visual description, I'm a white woman with brown hair wearing a blue shirt. Firstly, I'd like to share a little about IGPP before we begin. The Institute of Government and Public Policy, in close partnership with the University of East London, is a preeminent think tank with the goals of making governance and policy making more inclusive to a broad coalition of stakeholders. We are committed to delivering productive and positive content which enhances knowledge and disseminates excellence. I'd like to encourage everyone attending and speaking today to maintain a supportive, respectful and safe space so that we are all able to participate, ask questions and learn together. To give you some more information about our event platform for today, on the right hand side of your screen, you will see the live Q&A section. Here you can send in questions to speakers throughout the event. There will be opportunities for interactive Q&A sessions at various points throughout the day. Share your questions for the speakers and these will be addressed in each Q&A session. There is also a discussion forum. Uh, I will pop a message in there to get the discussion started, but please introduce yourself and connect with other throughout the day. This is your event. I really want to help you make the most out of it as possible. There is also a live poll section where you can vote and see what other delegates have said. If you would like to take any notes during the day, feel free to do so using the My Session Notes section on the right hand side of your screen. These can be exported out at the end of the event from the export button in the top right hand corner. Please remember to save your notes before the end of each session, otherwise you may lose them, so please just save as you go. If you're having any issues with your audio or visual experience, click on the little person on the top of your screen where you'll find the live support team. If you need any help throughout the day, audio, visual or otherwise, please drop a message into live support and our team will be there throughout the event to assist you. If there are any audio or visual uh, issues with speaker presentations, please note these are not due to our event platform, but we will aim to resolve these as soon as possible or provide a post-event recording where necessary. Any handouts or sli slides that have been shared by speakers will be available within four hours of the event finishing and will be available on this platform for three days post-event. This is the same with the recordings from today's sessions, which will also be available on the platform 30 days post event. Finally, all valuable. In, throughout the day, you will see a window pop up at the end of each session. So please take the time to rate, review, and give your feedback on each session. Here at IGPP, we only want to get better. And so please share your um, and if you do take part in any of these feedback opportunities, there is also a free place to an online IGPP event of your choice in the future. Please don't forget to ask questions and comment on the presentations. Visit the coffee lounge and interact with our exhibitors, Commensera and Unite, in the virtual exhibit ex during the break. Please keep a lookout for these and enjoy the sessions. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, John Penrose MP, the Prime Minister's anti-corruption champion. MP for the Western Supermare since 2005. His campaigns to reboot British capitalism so our economy works for the many, not the few, include the energy price cap, making housing cheaper to own or 
uh, urban owners and developers to build up, not out, making Britain's economy more generationally and socially just for a UK sovereign wealth fund, and reforming its formerly nationalised utilities to put customers in touch. A successful businessman before he entered politics, John has held a variety of posts since he was elected. He is currently the Prime Minister's anti-corruption champion, chair of the Conservative Policy Forum, and sits on the party's policy board. A keynote address on rooting out and improving resilience to fraud and corruption in a 350 pound billion industry. To John. Thank you very much, Rosella. Um, very kind introduction uh, and for setting out the uh, the course of the day for us. I'm delighted to be here. Really important issue. Um, and as you rightly pointed out in your introduction, uh, the bill has just been introduced to the House of Lords. I think it was last Wednesday. And um, so uh, I'm assuming that quite a lot of people on this call would have had a chance to at least skim it. Um, and uh, it's over 100 clauses, so it's, a, it's an enormous piece of, of, uh, of, of legislation. Um, what I was planning to do, therefore, in the course of my address is not to go through every single clause. Everyone, I'm sure, will be delighted to hear, um, but rather just to pick up on what I think are the, the key um, elements of the legislation. Um, but there are also, I've got to say, a whole series of uh, questions which I've got, and I'm sure many other people um, at this conference will have as we work through the detail, as we burrow through and what the various different things will mean um, over the course of the next weeks and months as the bill works its way through Parliament. So I'm um, also looking forward, I think, to the Q&A session later on um, to people's comments and thoughts at that stage as well. But the crucial thing about the procurement bill um, and previously the procurement green paper, which was the sort of precursor to it, um, is that it shows a really welcome, I think, um, chunk of ambition by government ministers to try and sort this out. And the, the reason why I think it needs sorting out is, is twofold. Um, one is just simply that, uh, the, uh, as you might expect from the, the, the Prime Minister's anti-corruption czar, it allows us, or should allow us if we do it right, to create a far more transparent, far um, uh, more in, insured and uh, against fraud process, something where we've designed out many of the opportunities to fraud and corruption. And, and by doing that, clearly, that's going to not just deliver better value for money for the taxpayer, um, but also, I hope, um, ensure that there's much greater levels of trust and credibility and integrity in our public processes. And that's all to do with sort of the, the underlying public faith in the state, if I can put it that way, which is um, particularly at the moment, particularly with what's going on in places like Ukraine um, and elsewhere in the world, is absolutely essential for democracies to be built on very, very strong and solid foundations of democratic consent. And you don't get democratic consent without people believing that the system is at least basically honest and set up to try and do the right things, even if it doesn't always perfectly achieve them. So that's an absolutely essential thing, which I'm particularly, you know, th this is a, a, a absolutely vital piece of legislation to move that agenda forward. But it isn't the only reason for doing this bill for, for introducing the procurement bill. The secondary reason, and, and one which I think is very important as well, um, is to make sure that we have, you know, given public procurement in the UK, to make sure we have the most effective, the most efficient, the most economically productive and digitally nimble um, process for spending all that public money so that we get the best value for public money, but also so that a wider variety of companies, a wider variety of bidders have the opportunity to get involved in accessing this market. Um, not only does that improve the competitive tensions and pressures and temperatures in the UK economy, it also just means that for small, um, you know, disruptive entrepreneurial firms, they get a chance to get a seat at the table to bid into some really big contracts, um, which before under the old system um, were much, much harder for them to get at. So there's a really big economic prize as well as a big sort of ethical and and uh, and, and cleanliness prize, if I can put it that way. Um, both those things matter. Um, and incidentally, um, for, for, for those, depending on how everybody voted in the 2016 Brexit referendum, whether you voted in favour or against Brexit at the time, um, there is a big opportunity here um, for removing some of the bureaucracy of the old system and trying to realise some of the promised benefits. Um, and as I said, whether or not you voted in favour or against it, we should at least now we are here, try to make sure that we maximise the opportunities and maximise the benefits of that. So getting rid of some red tape 
and reducing the regulatory burdens, again, to achieve a more nimble um, economy um, has to be a good thing too. So what are the things that are going to deliver this, uh, this nirvana, this, uh, this, all these promised benefits, which I've just been laying out? Well, I think there are several of them, um, but just to consider the backdrop for a second, it's worthwhile pointing out that the old public procurement rules, which were based on the EU's OGU principles, which I'm sure will be um, uh, extremely uh, you know, familiar to everybody who's, uh, who's attending this conference. Um, it's worthwhile pointing out that those rules um, actually did some rather important things, and we don't want to lose those important things in the transition from the old world to the new. Uh, the thing that it did was it mandated uh, a degree of transparency, it mandated a, a degree of competition, um, and it made it much, much harder for um, politicians, for public officials, um, or indeed for organized criminals to try and subvert processes and, and, and help cronies get soft contracts and those sorts of things. So the OGU principles did something important. We mustn't lose that. We must maintain what it did. But the aim, of course, is to do and achieve those same things um, in a much, much more nimble, much faster, um, much less bureaucratic and um, ideally much more digital um, uh, fashion. How are we going to do that? Well, I think there are three or four things that I'd highlight in the uh, in the bill that's just been introduced. And there's some questions attached to some of them too, but the, the things which I think are essential. And um, the first thing is that the bill rightly, I think, um, accepts and understands that the, that the procurement process is a genuine end-to-end -end process that starts when somebody starts saying, well, we need a new contract to achieve this or that public policy aim. And they start to put the contract together because obviously if you put the contract together, um, in a particular way, you can predetermine the results. You can predetermine who's going, who's likely to win it, um, and therefore you are going to you're going to lose an awful lot of the potential benefits of free and open competition um, if you define the contract in the wrong way. So right the way from the start of that process, all the way through to post contract award and uh, delivery, to make sure that actually the stated aims of the contract in the first place are genuinely being delivered for whoever the customers may be in each contracting in each contract sense, um, that whole process needs to be transparent and covered by this legislation. It's particularly, I think, noticeable in the anti-corruption world, which I spend quite a lot of time in, as you'll appreciate, um, that when people talk about procurement, what it's very easy to fall into the trap of is to talk about uh, publishing, the, publishing the contract itself. It's the moment of contract awarding, if you like, and being entirely transparent about what the contract terms and conditions say. And while that is important, clearly that's vital, um, it's very, very easy for people, particularly who aren't professionals in the field, and I'm acutely conscious that I'm talking to a, uh, a an audience which is full of professionals in the field, so I'm assuming you will all understand this instinctively, um, but it's very, very easy for people who are not quite so immersed in it as you um, to forget that there's all this upstream stuff that really matters and creates all sorts of opportunities for misbehavior or for beneficial outcomes if it's done right. And there's all this downstream stuff after the moment of, uh, of, of uh, contract awarding um, and contract publication, um, which also um, matters enormously. So taking a sort of end-to-end -end process view is absolutely essential. It's something which was frequently forgotten in the past. Um, and yeah, I'm glad to see that is sort of yeah, central to the to the new Bill, whether or not we will, it will get through with that intact um, after it's gone wending through the ways of Parliament. I, I devoutly hope it will, um, but that is clearly an important and central element of the bill as it's currently beginning its journey. And the second point is that the uh, it's all very well to publish transparently all sorts of data about upcoming contracts, the terms of the of the, of the intended contracts, the actual contract notices themselves and the details of them, and then performance against the contract downstream as well. All very well to publish that information, but we, we'll, we will have potentially hundreds of different public bodies issuing contracts and undertaking contracting and a public procurement. Um, and so therefore it's vital, absolutely vital, that we are able to use the information which is being publicly declared and transparently published um, in, a, in, in an effective way. And so the open contracting data standard is vital in a, a, because it will equip us or at least we hope it will, should equip us, to compare and analyze the information that's being uh, published um, and make sure that it is done on a way which is consistent across all public bodies so that everyone from armchair auditors um, in the, uh, the uh, anti-corruption space 
um, you know, the public realm, if you like, people who are watching to make sure that their, their taxpayers' money is being properly spent, quite rightly, um, through to um, people who are bidding for contracts who want to understand how they stand and how some of their potential rivals stand in the current uh, bidding stakes. And um, we should be able, providing everything is done according to the open contracting data standard, to analyze who's doing well, which firms are winning a lot of contracts and under what basis, um, and whether or not the money that's being spent is actually producing the intended and required results. So that data standard is a very, very basic, but absolutely essential piece, I think, of, um, of underlying sanitation, if you like. Um, it, it's, it's not something which is going to be politically terribly sexy or e exciting, but is absolutely essential as a way of delivering uh, the, the promised benefits. And without it, we would be um, you know, trying to do this with one hand tied behind our back. Other things that matter as well. Well, there's some some basic rules about conflicts of interest. Spotting a conflict of interest is half the uh, half the issue. So if you do have across all those hundreds of contracting bodies potential conflicts of interest, just having processes that allow you to spot them in advance and then take appropriate steps, because um, having a conflict of interest is not necessarily a disaster. Providing you then take the right steps to manage that conflict, make sure that it can't create unfair results. So uh, updating, capturing those potential conflicts of interest, and um, having some standards and some processes for that is absolutely essential. Um, and equally, and, and this is particularly important as we come out of the pandemic. Um, during the pandemic, uh, some of the stresses and strains of a slow and bureaucratic process, which is what, as I mentioned, was one of the major, major uh, criticisms of the old EU OJU processes. One of the difficulties of having a slow and bureaucratic process is that when you need to move fast, and in a pandemic, my goodness me, you absolutely do need to move fast. Um, you have to end up, or you end up in practice, short-circuiting an awful lot of the normal processes and using um, direct awards, limited tendering processes. Um, and you're still going to need those for national emergencies like pandemics, when there's a scramble to find PPE and there's a global shortage. You're still going to need those, but it is far, far better to have a process which is quicker and more nimble so that you don't need to go to limited tendering, reducing the levels of, of competition and choice. Um, that you can maintain full tendering for more of your contracting in future. And then when you do have to go to limited tendering, you still want to make that, again, as, as open and as transparent as you possibly can, even given the emergency of whatever it is that you're facing at the time. So those, those kind of processes will still exist. I'm hoping and expecting that the new uh, approach will mean that they are much less necessary and much more, uh, and much less frequently needed in future than in the past. A couple of other things, uh, th those are sort of the central things I think which, which matter mostly, um, but there are a couple of other things that will also be important, um, not just from a, uh, an ethical and an anti-corruption point of view, but I think again also from a value for money point of view, there's going to be an exclusions regime. Um, so so um, companies and, and organizations which are bidding for public contracts, um, if they've been, um, if they won't disclose who their beneficial owner is. So if they have a brilliant track record, but it turns out that they are owned by a Russian oligarch who's sanctioned or someone else like that, or a, a crime lord, a, 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 either a, a, a gun runner or, a, or, a, or a, 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 a drugs cartel or something like that, then we need to know that um, because actually the underlying um, honesty of that, of that organization and the ethical questions about whether or not they should be bidding for British businesses um, is very, very important indeed. So we need to understand that. And we also need to understand whether or not um, firms that are bidding have um, convictions for serious tax offences and those sorts of things, um, or whether or not they've been part of cartels and, uh, and monopolies. So there's going to be a, a, a process for disclosing those things and then in, extreme, in serious cases saying, well, actually, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, until you clean up your act, you are not going to be allowed to bid for British public procurement. Uh, contracts at all. And, and I think that will just reduce the inherent risks of you know, the sorts of things which many people on, at this conference will naturally undertake as part of their know your customer routines. And um, those sorts of things will be absolutely essential too. And finally, um, the other essential item I would argue, and this is a piece of plumbing, but it matters enormously, um, is the procure procurement review unit, which is a central unit, which will basically police the entire system, make sure that um, for example, the open contracting data standard is being properly applied and properly adhered to, and that this whole system is being run um, effectively. I was going to just make uh, things happen. Um, so I think that's that's probably me done. Um, I don't know if that was someone interesting me to tell me that I've reached my uh, my.
my, my I think I'm one minute off my, uh, my my final time, but I'm very happy to to to, to finish there. So I think what we've got is a very, very promising set of new regulations and rules. They have to go through Parliament. There are all sorts and there will be all sorts of associated uh, details which will need to be answered and questions which I don't yet have the answer to, but I'm going to be asking and I'm sure people at this conference will want to ask as well. So this is the beginning of a journey, um, but if we can deliver what was in the green paper and what now seems to be mostly in the uh, in the draft bill that's just been presented to Parliament, um, then I think it will be a massive step forward. And as I said, the two big goals, the two big prizes that we're aiming for here, um, one being a more ethical system, one, one that is uh, has designed out many of the potential loopholes and opportunities which fraudsters and organised criminals and oligarchs and anybody else might be able to exploit, but also which creates a much more open, transparent and competitive market for public procurement contracts so that we get a much more productive, better value for, for taxpayers' money, but also a much more uh, widespread set of opportunities for smaller firms, uh, entrepreneurial firms, disruptors, new entrants into markets, so that perhaps some of the traditional bidders, um, if they're good, they will carry on winning contracts and all power to them when they do, um, but they also won't be able to take anything for granted in future um, because it will be that much more competitive and the competitive pressures and temperatures will be that much higher. So with that, I will, Rosella, um, hand back to you. hope that is a good uh, initial um, setting of the scene. Um, I'm sure there are masses of questions, which I'm looking forward to later when we get to that session. Um, and either I will be able to answer them or my fellow panellists, um, or if we can't, um, then there are an awful lot of questions which I want to ask ministers when this thing comes through Parliament. Um, and I will be taking notes to make sure I've got a list of other questions which your, uh, your, your, your contributors um, think are important. so interesting to hear your thoughts and insights on delivering the benefits of the bill through the and taking that end-to-end -end process and no